Hi, Eli. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. Good? Twitter, yeah. bringing blogging heads together. Twitter has brought us together. Yes. And I should apologize, first of all, for an unkept look that I'm currently sporting. As, as am I. I'm, I'm are uh, you? Have you, like, not shaved for days? That's what happened to me. Oh, no, no. I haven't, it's, it's not that I haven't. I'm just not wearing like, a tie because I'm working from home today. Oh, and yeah. I forgot mine, too. It's so yeah. hot out that I'm wearing, a, a like, a linen shirt, you know, not really like a formal thing. But That's excusable. In the dog days of August. Yeah. So, yeah, Twitter did bring us together. Yes, uh, I should probably say something about the genesis of this. Sure. So this conversation started on Twitter yesterday. Um, well, really, really, if you think about it, it started like a month ago. You could, yes. Well, you tweeted something that alluded to a piece I had written a right. month ago uh, accusing someone of practicing McCarthyism. We can we can get into that a little. I don't want to relitigate the whole thing, but we will we will be. Right. Alluding to that, anyway, what your tweet did is refer to that and then say, well, is Robert Ryder, that would be me, going to apply the same standard to the Senate Majority Leader, meaning Harry Reid, and right. his, his accusation that sources he can't name say that Mitt Romney hasn't paid taxes for 10 years. Um, and I, you know, I thought, oh, man, I hate arguing by Twitter. It's, it's hard. You know, oh, yeah, no, I an argument with any subtlety doesn't belong there. So I kind of just reflexively said, do you want to debate this on blogging heads? You said yes. It, and, and I think we had slightly different conceptions of what the discussion was going to be about. I was thinking I was going to just uh, argue that Harry Reid, A, does not, this does not constitute McCarthyism, uh, and it doesn't constitute McCarthyism as I have applied the term in the past in, in, in the aforementioned piece. Um, but then you uh, had something a little different in mind, I guess, right? Um, because the, the, the piece, my accusation of McCarthyism and had to do with my claim that someone was, was too loosely throwing around charges of anti-Semitism and was doing so in a kind of McCarthyite fashion. It turns out you want to kind of pick up on that, on the substance of anti-Semitism allegations, and, and I think your belief that, that there is a lot of that afoot. Uh, but, but anyway, you can tell me what you think our agenda should be. Well, I wanted to talk about the use and abuse of McCarthyism in 2012, because it's, okay. there's a couple examples of how it's been used. And uh, you mean of the term McCarthyism? Yes, and the, the allegation and of the concept of, of mm -hmm. McCarthyism, and whether we've we've kind of uh, diluted its its potency uh, by applying it to things that it shouldn't be applied to. Which I think, in your case of the case about Armin Rosen, I, I would I would say it, it did not apply. And then if if we want, I, 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 the, the anti-Semitism question um, is, is almost, as a word, it doesn't really get us where we want to go. I'm interested in the mainstreaming of theories about, um, theories about Jewish influence in foreign policy and how, at least, you know, as I, as I could say, you know, over the course of the last 10 years, more and more people are using what I think is a largely false theory to explain U.S. foreign policy through this prism of the Israel lobby. Uh, and that is not, uh, you know, that I think that sometimes can be a species of anti-Semitism, but using that word in the context of a discussion like that, I think does more to shut down the debate and kind of get up defenses. And, and, I, and I'd, I'd rather almost debate it on the merits of it, which I think, uh, or the, the substance of it, which I don't, I don't think it's an adequate theory of why the United States does what it does in the Middle East or, or, or in a broader okay. sense. So we plan to get into all this stuff. Can we start with Harry Reid partly because that will give me a chance sure. to tell you what I mean by McCarthy, okay. McCarthyism in a fairly abstract sense. Okay, okay. so I, I think you, you said, I didn't see this, but Bob Schieffer actually did accuse Harry Reid of McCarthyism. Is that right? He said it sounded to him like McCarthyism because he was referring to a, um, an anonymous source right. who told him that Mitt Romney had not paid his tax. And McCarthy famously held up a list and said, I have here the names of 51, 53, right, whatever, of course, people right. in the U.S. government who are, who are communist traitors or something like that. Right. And, and, and he was, you know, he, he said, so there was, there, there is a very vague parallel right. there of, of not, of claiming to have evidence without fully fleshing every, everything about its context out. Now, what I would say is, first of all, I would, I would, I think of McCarthyism as having two dimensions. One is that the goal 
is ostracism. It's to expel someone uh, from the community or the community of discourse. So, uh, you know, if you if you can convince America that someone is a traitor, well, that will do it. I mean, even leaving aside the legal repercussions of them having committed treason, whatever they've done, you know, nobody's going to be running their op-eds. They are no longer respectable citizens. The, the right. same goes with anti-Semitism and with racism. And I think rightly, if you actually do successfully make the case that someone is an anti-Semite or racist, uh, yeah, I wouldn't publish their op-eds. And, 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 and I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's good. But by the same token, precisely because uh, your goal is such severe punishment, I think you you have an obligation to amass your evidence very carefully. And that brings us to the second dimension of McCarthyism, which is a failure to do that, right? And, and a reliance uh, on things like uh, guilt by association or, as, as we just said, you know, kind of saying you have evidence but not being kind of clear. Um, so I would say, first of all, uh, Harry Reid does not have the McCarthyite goal in mind. He's not trying to ostracize Mitt Romney. He's not accusing him of being, being, being a traitor, a racist, an anti-Semite. Um, I'd also say that the, the evident, you know, his, his use of evidence is not, uh, is, not, is not very McCarthyite, really. I mean, you know, Eli, surely you, as a journalist, have, have said... I have a source who says X, and yeah. X was very unfavorable to someone, and they said, well, who is your source? And you said, I'm not going to tell you, right? Well, uh, let me answer that specifically and then kind of circle back. I, I am of the view, as Beth Lipsky at the New York Sun had as Firewall and other newspapers have, that you can't just accuse someone in a news story uh, with anonymous sources of something that's like a serious kind of allegation or um, an ad hominem attack personal insult or something like that. You shouldn't use anonymous sources to say somebody is an adulterer or is a... Uh, okay, but, but that's not what Harry Reid's saying. He's not even claiming it's illegal that Mitt Romney didn't pay right. taxes. Right. Um, but I, what, I, what I'm saying is that, yes, I rely on anonymous sources all the time, but if I, I, I can't... I, I don't think it's... it's I, I think it's, it's... I don't want to say it. I don't want to get into ethics. It's, it's, it's shoddy, I think. It's not... It's, 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 it's a weaker kind of journalism to to do a kind of sources say and then have that then be the sources who are anonymous, you're giving them the cloak of anonymity to make a kind of, um, you know, accusation. And then you're saying, can you defend yourself against it? It's unfair to the target. Um, and if you have evidence of something, and like you can use anonymous sources if it's genuinely sensitive information and if the person was to use their name, they would be fired or, you know, violating security rule, uh, classification well, rules. Or, or if you like just that. got the information under those conditions, right? If right. the person says, I'll only give you the information if you don't, yeah. You know, disclose my name, and apparently, either implicitly or explicitly, assuming this person exists, right. then either implicitly or explicitly, that's the deal Harry Reid has. Right, but I agree with you that I don't think what Harry Reid did is McCarthyism, but for a different kind of reason, because I, for me, the test of McCarthyism is, is twofold, and I don't think it's necessarily ostracism. What McCarthyism, uh, it makes it kind of odious, is it's one, an abuse of political power in some particular case. So the person making the accusation has the ability, just by airing that accusation, to ruin your life so that nobody will hire you anymore, that it's not just a matter of not having your op-eds run. In, in re the case of real McCarthyism, people lost their jobs, you know, foreign service officers, because of, a, of an allegation that was based in large part on secret evidence, and that's another element of McCarthyism, which is that you don't really have a chance to defend yourself, and the allegation is so toxic that it ruins your chances of employment, it ruins your life after right. that. And that McCarthyism, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., with Senator Joe McCarthy, is only the tip of the iceberg. In this period, similar, like, kind of local politicians use this tactic, tactic against, you know, school board officials and other things like that. So you had, a, a, you know, what was called at the time the Red Scare. And um, as somebody... You know, who I would like to think, I would hope to think that during the Cold War I would have been, uh, you know, on the hawkish side against sort of international communism. The people, uh, you know, Buckley himself, who at first praised uh, McCarthy, later acknowledged that he did a great disservice to the cause of anti-communism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would recommend a, a great uh, book review by uh, Michael Moynihan, the guy who mm -hmm. just sleuthed out 
Don't Aware right. uh, from 2008, and we can link it. I'll give you the link, where he goes through, um, it's a book review of Blacklisted by History by um, M. Stanton Evans, uh, where he really does kind of go through exactly why McCarthy was so dangerous in that respect. But to the point, so I associate McCarthyism, like the, the, the McCarthyite has to be in a kind of position of power. And so the reason why I, the first reason I disagreed with your, your piece is because Harmon Rosen is an intern at the okay, Atlanta. First, can, can, I okay. just, can I yeah. just finish on Harry sure. Reid before okay, let's, you go okay, to that? Because sure. you highlighted another difference between, you know, McCarthyism and what Reid is doing. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you and I seem to agree that the extremity, uh, uh, the severity of what Reid is right. accusing Romney of does not rise to McCarthyite levels. It wouldn't, you know. Well, it's a uh, serious allegation, but it's also Romney himself is a powerful figure. He's not in danger of losing his livelihood. He's running for president. It's a presidential election. He's a uh -huh. public figure. The Senate majority leader is also a public figure. And this is really more in the realm of you want to criticize it, you know, you could call it mudslinging. But I would say it doesn't, rem it doesn't rise to the level of McCarthyism. Okay. And I just want to point one, yeah. one other thing you alluded to. You, you yeah. said... The person doesn't have a chance to defend, you know, uh, him or herself, and and that was it, that wasn't just a power thing. It was like it was in the nature of the allegation. It was like McCarthy is saying, "I think you have some communist association somewhere." Well, you can't prove, right? It's like you can't prove that negative. You can't prove that you've never, ever, ever, you know. Whereas Mitt Romney, it's totally in his power to disprove this. It's simple: release the taxes, and if it's not true. It will be evident. So I think, in that sense too, uh, the, the charge is just not as as unfair as a classic McCarthyite charge. That, right. Uh, right. Well, we agree. It's not the Harry Reid is, is not is not that's not McCarthyism. It's only the only element that's McCarthyism is the use of secret evidence in a public forum and by a powerful politician. But because his his target is another powerful politician who won't lose his job because of this, because as you said. He, you know, it's, 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 this is not like sort of trying to prove that, you know, you were never a member of the Communist Party, which is a very hard to prove a negative. It's your tax returns. And it's in the context of a kind of political debate. Uh, I think it's wrong to call it McCarthy. Okay. Okay. So, moving so now on. you want to talk about this thing, which actually when I said on Twitter, let's debate this, I didn't actually anticipate talking about, but uh, if you want to talk about it, fine, which is the, the, the backdrop of this which is that uh, this guy at the Atlantic, whom I've since talked to, I had not talked to at the time. You know him. Is that I right? do. I also know him. Yes. Right. Uh, named Armin Rosen had written this piece in the Atlantic. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure I'm not characterize it unfairly. Well, he said, uh, y you know, uh, this guy, a Alex Kane, is, that's the, right. uh, the staff writer at, right. Mondo, at the website MondoWise. Right. Had, had posted, had already posted something, I think, on, on Peter Beinert's blog, Open Zion, which is part of Daily Beast and hence Newsweek. My, right, so, right. And, 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 and which, I'm not, which is, I'm, I'm which not which telling Peter what to put on his blog. So we're talking about yeah. my employer, The Atlantic, and your employer. So really, if we had any brains, neither of us would say anything further at all. Right. But, but fortunately, uh, but, but anyway, he was saying that your... they should not have published Alex Kane. Uh, he was saying a reputable site like Newsweek shouldn't publish as I understood it, he, Alex Kane, because Alex Kane works for Mondo Weiss, and, and then uh, Armin uh, argued that Mondo Weiss, I gives forget how he phrased it. Gives the appearance of being it, an anti-Semitic enterprise. Gives the appearance or something. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so I said, so just to finish out the yeah, yeah. analytical part, I thought this did meet the two criteria. A, the, um, it, I think it's a very grave charge, anti-Semitism, racism, it's like communism. It's it's like yeah, you 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 would have trouble getting a job. I mean, if you uh, successfully stigmatize, no, seriously, if you right. convince the world that no respectable publication should 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 publish this person's work, well, that's a real career liability. Okay. Okay. And 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 I thought it was um, the the evidentiary part of it. I I, I contended was McCarthyite in the sense. I thought there were a couple of problems with the evidence. First of all, there was no claim that there was any evidence that Alex Kane himself had ever shown himself to be anti-Semitic. The argument was, well, he works for this place. And, and I said, well, first of all, that's guilt by association, uh, you know, a McCarthyite thing. And then secondly, 
when it came to his argument that Mondo Weiss is uh, anti-Semitic, I mean, I don't know enough about Mondo Weiss or any other s site to uh, to stand up and say, you, you, you know, the, you, there's there's no, you'll you'll find nothing on the site that's anti-Semitic. But I did follow the links that Armin provided, and I said, well, he's clearly operating with a looser definition of anti-Semitism than I am, and and I think if you're going to make what I think is a very grave allegation of anti-Semitism, you need to be really rigorous. You need to say, okay, this is what I mean by anti-Semitism. This is what constitutes it. And, and, this is, and this is why this qualifies. And I just didn't think that was done. Okay. Um, here's why I object to pulling out McCarthyism. One, Armin Rosen is um, not a powerful person yet. He's an intern at The Atlantic. And he doesn't really have the uh, power. I mean, I, if it was a hugely, you know, if it was a, a, a Tom Friedman, if you will, right? I mean, that may be because he has such a platform and everybody reads him or something like that. But Rosen is not there. In fact, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's just sort of making his bones. And um, the point that he was making, I... Um, without kind of getting into it, because as I said, it's not for me, and I don't want to get into mm -hmm. what Beinart should or shouldn't put on his website. And then the other thing I would say is that, and I, what I've told Armin is that, as a general rule, if you're going to go after a writer, go after the writer what they've written and not not stuff that they've appeared on. But I do think that in the case of Mondo Weiss, you have a website that um, has uh, you know an agenda, and one of those agenda is to mainstream the use of the terms like Israel firster and the mode of attack, which is to question the loyalties of writers like myself and others who they see as part of a kind of pro-Israel uh, effort to, uh, I don't know, uh, to, to influence U.S. foreign policy on behalf of a, of a foreign government, in this case, uh, Israel. And, and, and again, I would not use McCarthyism for Mondo Weiss because they're a fringe website that doesn't have a lot of influence. Uh, beyond people who go in for that kind of thing, you, but you wouldn't accuse them of McCarthyism. No, because they're not powerful because enough. right because they don't. Like the, if if Mondo, Mondo Weiss has said things about me plenty of times and and other things like them, and it has had zero effect, and I and I don't expect it to have any effect on my career or in anything like that. So again, the the threshold of being powerful and having just the allegation be toxic and from a powerful enough person that it would be. Uh, so limiting and ruin your life in that sense. Mondo Weiss does not have that power, but I thought it was ironic because one of the things that they want to do, it does echo of a kind of element of that McCarthyism, which is to make the claim that what one believes intellectually or what one thinks uh, is evidence in and of itself or a priori of disloyalties to the United States. And that was the other thing about McCarthyism that's so toxic, which is that he, he, he was unable to distinguish between liberals in the 1930s who wanted, you know, the New Deal program to succeed and real communist spies and communist agents. And the failure to distinguish between somebody who thinks labor unions are a good idea and somebody who wants, you know, Soviet cells all over the United States to subvert the American government is another feature of McCarthyism. And I would say that the rhetoric and style of Amando Weiss is to conflate pro-Israel Americans with um, you know, foreign agents or agents of influence on behalf of Israel. Okay. Let me say, first of all, you know, as I said to you in an email before this, yeah. when I discovered you wanted to talk about yeah. this stuff, you know, I don't want to try anyone mm -hmm. in absentia here, you know, my advice or any person. Um, it's like, I'm not qualified to defend them. And, and okay. so I think, I think anyone, you know, if they want to argue with you on blogging heads, anyone they, they want to appoint is there, you know, that's, that's, fine with yeah. me and I assume it's it's fine with you so I'm not uh, you know, uh, you That's know a fair I, enough I, point, I'm, I'm going to step in yeah. as the defense attorney that doesn't yeah, make yeah, sense but enough. but I will the, the one point you made about uh, in terms of my argument that Armin didn't have wasn't a powerful figure well he was saying it under the Atlantic's brand and that's it that's that's a magazine that over more than 100 years has earned, you know, very uh, significant respect. So there was, in that sense, power behind the allegation. And that's the only reason I bothered to reply is because I work for The Atlantic and I didn't want to see the name used in that way. Um, and, and so there was that kind of 
uh, power behind the allegation. Uh, but but that's that's kind of a footnote. Uh, you know, so well, okay, what, I, what I said is, although I don't think we should try specific people uh, in right. absentia, I, I'm happy to discuss. I would say it in the abstract, then, because it's beyond Mondo Weiss. There, is a, there, are, there are writers who um, not just term Israel first, but have focused on this idea that, uh, you know, that there are journalists, that there are, you know, groups of people that are somehow uh, automatically discounted and, 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 are, and are acting under the agency of a foreign power, which is Israel. And that is often combined. People who often believe that also think that Israel is, you know, um, are kind of mystified as to why Israel is considered an ally when they, when, they, when they feel that America would be much better if they didn't have this close relationship. Now, my point here is that if you think that, if you think that Israel should not be an ally of the United States, Go ahead, write your write your articles, and I think that you'll you. I I I don't. I, I think it's a, a myth that that somehow that view can't you know will will will, will limit your uh, rise in places like the academy uh, or in other places. Um, you know, if you want to know if there's like one consensus position among at least the media elite or the political elite, it's of a two-state solution. So if you think that. Uh, if you're a one-stater on the far Israeli right or you're a one-stater on the Palestinian side of it, then that, th those views are not yet mainstreamed and they're often kind of questioned. But, um, and so that's, that's where I think there really is this kind of at least American consensus. But certainly the notion that, you know, people who, sell, who, who are advocates of the Israeli right or like the settlement mm -hmm. expansions, I don't think those people have a hold on the elite conversation. I don't think those people have... Um, a lot of influence at the highest levels in Washington, and I think that they are in many ways more marginalized today than they were 15, 20 years ago. Okay, so let's let's take okay. an example that's relevant to this abstraction. Okay, Sheldon Adelson. I assume. Yes, I just read about him. Okay, so I didn't see the piece, but I assume you know he, he's he's uh, poised to give a lot of money in in the uh, in support of the Romney campaign. Mm -hmm. I mean, tons. Um, he, Hundred million uh, is what he said. He, I, I assume that that you agree that people tend to do this because they would like to influence policy yep. in, the, in the coming administration. Uh, I assume you would agree that high on Sheldon Adelson's list of policy priorities is Israel, right? Yes. So, so to point those things out and, and, and further to go in and look at specific things Adelson has said about war with Iran, whatever, and infer that that is what the, the – the, the pursuing those goals is what the the money is is to some extent at least in the service of is 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 saying that anti-Semitic? Uh, no, because Adelson is very open about what he says. If he's saying that Adelson, who's an American citizen, is you know doing Israel's it, it, my my issue is the um, marginalization of Americans or saying that Americans can have all kinds of views, you know. And my point back to kind of full circle on McCarthyism is that. You don't want to get in a position where you interpret the substance of one's views on something to mean a de facto disloyalty to the United States. And so that's so pointing out that Sheldon Adelson. Listen, I just wrote an article. Adelson, Sheldon Adelson once uh, it was a scoop. Adelson wanted Romney to come out for the clemency of Jonathan Pollard, the Israeli right. spy, mm -hmm. and Romney quietly said, "I can't do that. I haven't seen all the evidence yet." So lots of donors ask lots of things of, of candidates, particularly in a presidential campaign, and they don't necessarily get what they want. So that's the first thing. The other thing is Adelson came very late to the game with Romney uh, in the primary. You remember, he endorsed Newt Gingrich, who came closer on the Pollard issue uh, than Romney has uh, in public. Mm -hmm. And the notion that there's kind of a quid pro quo with Romney, I just don't think that that's how, at least on something like Iran, for example, that's just not how the world works. Um, because what, what's going to drive an Iran decision, whether to uh -huh. U.S. or Israel attack, is going to be the perception of where Iran is on their nuclear program, and it's not going to be the influence of law. You know, it's, it's not like a okay, policy so wait, decision. So, yeah. so to you, that's the key thing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying it's not anti-Semitic to say this guy has these goals. Yeah, and he's especially since he's said them. them. It, are you, but, but are you saying that it's anti-Semitic to say, in principle, he could be successful? But Because you're saying that, no, war is in this special category. It would never be influenced by donations or something? Listen, if you say that Adelson, who has himself said, I would like the president or the government to do X, Y, and Z, okay, well, then that's just factual. 
the, re, the where it gets into an area, as again, uh, I mean, if you want to call it, I, I, I think it's a species of anti-Semitism, but it's certainly not the same as the Nuremberg Laws or other kinds of things. Um, but it, where it gets into problem for me is if you say oh, that... Wait, 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 what, is it, what is a species of anti-Semitism? When you say that Adelson is more loyal to Israel than to the United States because of the substance of what he'd like to see the United States government do. Um, that's the, okay, that, so, that's so the problem. It's, so, it's, it's the Israel first or So if you make the Israel lobby argument without using the term dual loyalty or... or Yes, if you say that he has an agenda, and here's what it is. He wants you to release Pollard. He wants you to, uh, you know, let, you know, not, you know, I don't know. He wants you to, the stand aside of Israel was to attack Iran. He wants you to do this, that, and the other. These are the things that he has himself said, um, and he has a lot of money. Then that, to me, I, I don't see any problem so, with that. So what would you say to a Leon Wieseltier who wrote a thing a long time ago, if I'm remembering correctly, Saying, although I may be relying wholly on a paraphrasal by Mickey Cows, so, but 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 saying, and this is kind of my feeling in a way, is everyone has lots of loyalties. It shouldn't surprise us if someone has a loyalty uh, to something other than the United States. I do. You know, there there are there are things I care about that are not just the interest of the United States and that may not be wholly aligned with that. And in the case of, like, the Cuba lobby, we talk about it in a very matter-of-fact way. We say that, we say that uh, you know, some of the support for NATO expansion was to get Polish-American votes in the Midwest or something, you know. And, and that, that, yeah, seems like could be. So what, what do you, it, if Wieseltier says, sure, there are dual loyalties and some of them involve Israel and there are dual loyalties involving other things and quadruple loyalties... I mean, is that that's well, not I, I'm not, to you? I'm a huge uh, Leon fan. Are you still there, Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of his writing, and unfortunately, I have not read that essay. Well, um, I'll so. have to ask Mickey. Mickey, Mickey. Uh, yeah, but um, is it is it is the definitive source on this? But but I think the upshot was, and and, and uh, is why need it be inherently scandalous when we you know. Uh, you do talk about the Cuba lobby that way, right? No, I don't think that the Cuba... First of all, the Cuba lobby would, would does not have a homeland because they're against Cuba. They're, it's, it's, it's so they're, Cuba but, but, like, I don't see that as any it's, less it's, American. I mean, like, I, I think there's all kinds of non-Cuban Americans who think that Castro, uh, you know, should be pressured and favor, I guess, regime change for the island for reasons that have nothing to do with the fact that they may have owned property in Cuba before mm -hmm. the revolution under Batista. So the, 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 I don't think that that exactly works. The second thing is, is that, and maybe I'm attuned to it because at times I have been an object of this particular kind of stuff, but the problem is, is that there seems to be a kind of special obsession in the last 10 years with the Israel lobby as I think a theory that at least the theory itself is overdetermined. It's like that the reason, like, I mean, you wrote something recently, and I'm not in any, I'm not, I want to get, I'm not calling you anti Semitic. I know you, and I'm not, that's not what I'm doing here. But you wrote something in June about how Obama was worried about uh, his re election and what it would mean with the pro Israel lobby, and that's why he couldn't do everything he could in a negotiation with right. Iran. And that just strikes me as so, like. Wait, wait, you think. Really seriously, Eli. Yeah, yeah. That the things that Obama is saying about Iran are not at all influenced by the kind of reaction he anticipates uh, from people like APAC. You really think that? I think that your theory of to why Obama did not give everything the Iranians wanted in the nuclear talks manages to totally ignore the actions and behavior of Iran themselves, and the history of their negotiating behavior where they act as if they want to reach a deal and then suddenly that deal evaporates and goes away. And how many times that's been going on. And missing from all that context is that Obama's the president when he and his own attorney general have said that there was an Iranian plot to kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington. Lots of Iranians are arrested all over the world, uh, you know, from Turkey to Cyprus to Azerbaijan on these terrorism charges. The president and the secretary of state have accused the Iranians of supplying and working with the Syrian regime as it enters into these bloody crackdowns against innocent people 
all over the country in their revolution, and you explain the behavior or the failure of the U.S. to have right. a more pro-Iranian position to lobby? What about the Iranians? Why, why? I mean, the Iranians themselves are actors in this drama. And I think a of lot course, of... Of course, of yeah. course they are. And you could do an exegesis on what determines their positions, and you could right. argue about whether their misbehavior... Uh, should influence our policy in certain ways, but none of that excludes the kind of analysis I did. And let me ask you a related question, okay? So Mitt Romney recently did something uh, that I think was very significant, that, you know, there was this, this uh, Dan Senor came out, you know, uh, during Romney's trip abroad, he's a Romney advisor, and he said uh, he seemed to be uh, kind of making the red line clearly different from the Obama red line, and basically... Well, two things, two things. It was, it was um, that, okay, uh, the, the red line isn't just getting a weapon, it's getting nuclear capability, which we won't get into. You and I kind of know what that means, and a lot yeah. of people do. Secondly, that, you know, he kind of said, and if Israel uh, needs to strike, you know, to keep them from getting capability, we'll stand behind them. Now, there was, there was discussion over whether that was or was not subsequently watered down significantly by Romney and other aides. I contend that if you go look at Romney's actual speech, this is he was this was a significant development where Romney said clearly capability, not weapons is the red line a and and in that same paragraph, you know, we'll stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. So I, I maintain that uh, he was he was really standing by what senior said. But in any event, are you telling me that you think it's a coincidence that this whole thing happened while Romney was in Israel? Uh, I mean, you, you yeah, really well, actually, I, think, I am. I, I... I'm very familiar. I've written a lot about Romney's foreign policy team and everything like that. Um, and I can tell you that Romney, since 2007, in his speech to Herzliya, has said Iranian capabilities. And Romney and every other presidential candidate has also said they respect uh, Israel's decisions or rights to defend itself, including Obama when he's been sure, president. In the abstract. And this is the I'm saying I'm saying this stuff right here is the is 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 clearly kind of what you do in the middle of a political campaign. You say a lot of things. But I have to tell you that the unspoken word in all this sort of talk about the influence of the lobby, as it were, is that the lobby is a cheap date. Every politicians have been promising to move the embassy to Jerusalem, which, by the way, would 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 have enormous diplomatic consequences for the U.S. positioning uh, in the Middle East overall, and particularly in terms of the conflict. It couldn't really be an honest broker if it did that. So that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. But people promise it anyway. And so a lot of this is just symbolic posturing right, but that actually Iran doesn't, and that doesn't, like, what? War with Iran is not symbolic. No, it's it not would... symbolic, but I'm telling you that, like, what, that w the decision on what happens about whether when the Israelis, if they decide to do something, or if the U.S. decides to do something, or frankly, as we now know, there's been a, I mean, like, there's a great new book by David Christ, I highly recommend, go through it, you can see that there's really been what he calls a twilight war, a secret war between the U.S. and Iran since... 1980, 1979. But the point, the point being that, and, 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 and we now know also, by the way, that Obama has in meant probably escalated elements of that shadow war, including in the cyber front. So you know, my view has always been that presidents are going to do what they can in the shadows to try to deter, delay, and sabotage the Iranians, and then try to do as much as they can uh, without it getting to that point. But that's, those, that's like the real decision, and it's going to be driven by intelligence, not okay. by lobbies. And that's, okay. the, that's the key thing. Okay, so let me just make sure though okay. that I that I um, understand you. You 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 think that um, both you know our negotiating position with respect to Iran um, and everything else uh, that influences the chances of war um, with Iran uh, has no has not influenced at all the policies. Uh, and utterances of Obama are not influenced at all by concern about APAC, evangelical Christians who are, you know, so-called Christian Zionists or whatever, uh, Jewish voters in Florida, whatever. You're saying, you're saying no significant influence. I'm saying, well, significant influence, however you want to measure it. What I'm saying is that you cannot explain the negotiating positions, which probably we don't even know because a lot of these negotiations happen, you know, you hear one thing afterwards and what is said in the room is usually a little bit different. But, but the, when you wrote that the reason why Obama has not had a package that the Iranians can accept uh, is because he doesn't want to offend the lobby, 
you were asserting that the cause of his diplomacy was the lobby. What I'm saying is that I think there are a bunch of different factors that are the reason for U.S. diplomacy. I'm not entirely sure we know exactly what the diplomatic position really was. Well, I, I, and more importantly, I think that, you know, the burden is now clearly on the Iranians. And the effect of that piece that you wrote is that if it weren't for the lobby, we may have a peace deal. Crazy. Uh, I think... I think that we don't have a peace deal because the Iranians want a nuclear weapon and they want to use these talks to delay, and I'm basing that on their behavior, you know, for the last almost 10 years now. Well, we'll link to my piece. Okay. I mean, I actually don't All think right. I used the term Israel lobby until the last paragraph, but you're, you're, you're certainly right that I said that uh, it was, uh, and I'm not the only one to, to report this. Um, yes, there is a rising, it's, 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 no, it's becoming I mean, a popular I'm theory not, among I'm a certain not, kind I'm of... I'm not saying he said exactly right. the same thing, but you know, Ron Campeas of, 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 of JTA, I was relying on his reporting. I'm not saying he buys into my thesis entirely, but he, I'm sure you'll agree he's a good reporter, and, and he reported on assurances that were given to, you know, whatever it is, the organization of organizations, you know, you know. Conference of Presidents. Right. <laughs> the uh, of, uh, uh, king, king of Kings, as Mike Kinsley used All to right. call it. Um, the uh, So, you know, uh, it's, it's not like, and, 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 and here's the thing, is when you talk about to Washington people in the NGO world, the think tank world, arms proliferation world, and I've talked to a number of them yes. who are very focused on this issue. As it's not even, Eli, what I said is it's not even controversial. The yes, argument, among, among, in, in that crowd, a okay. lot of people think that. I mean, the, but the well, argument, but that doesn't mean the it's argument right. is, it means well, a lot of deeper than we thought. Caving. It's not, is he caving? It's, I, I mean, a number of people will say, look, until the election, he can't afford to offend these people. But what I reported, and this is why I, I, I said it out loud, is because Every everyone I talk to in Washington takes it for granted, but no one is saying it. Well, you ought to get you ought to get out more. But um, I would I would uh, let me let me let me rebut this though because I happen to have it in front of me. Um, Campius writes that administration emphasizes that they will be steadfast in holding one key Israeli demand that sanctions not be sacrificed to the negotiating process. But that is in fact the Obama position. The Obama position has been, we gave them a period where we paused the sanctions and we tried to reach out to them. And he wrote them letters and he did all kinds of things. And when there was the moment in June 2009 when lots of Iranians came to the streets because they thought an election was stolen, uh, the administration was slower to react to that. Mm. And they still kept trying to get this negotiating process going. And the Iranians, remember, the Iranians, they were the ones at the time being obstinate. And now that it's come around and they're back to the table, the administration says, at every opportunity you can ask, see, our strategy of engagement and then sanctions has worked. And I just think that you're making a mountain out of a molehill. If the Iranians had decided that they were going to suspend their enrichment, then I think you would find that there would be sanctions that would in turn be suspended, probably. And as I said, also, um, understand that actually, we don't know we don't know what the content of the negotiation package is. We no. know what the White House or a National Security Council official told the Conference of Presidents. One of many stakeholders, I might add, well, that the not, White House like meets with to discuss evidence. this very important issue. It's not okay. like that's the only uh, evidence by any means. Um, no, but my the, point my point is is that that like what are we even talking about? The, if the Iranians wanted to see the sanctions. Relax. There's a whole bunch of things that are in their power to do right now, and they haven't done. So, well, so, well, so you're uh, saying uh, yeah, the fact that, you, that, that the Eli, sanctions have sure, not been relaxed you, I mean, for should... nothing is evidence of the lobby's influence and power. I say, no, it's evidence of a strategy that says we think the sanctions, I mean, that's what, that's what they think. I don't, I, I'm not, First of all, I want to know, put keep, myself on record. I'm skeptical the term the lobby strategy. to me, Eli. I right? almost never use that term, okay? And, and okay. you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's anti-Semitic to use it, and, but, but I, I just almost never talk that way because I don't think of it as some kind of centrally coordinated thing, okay? So Good. don't, it's Good. kind of, you know, okay. that, that's not the way I conceive it. Okay. Um, but I will say that, that just we shouldn't spend the whole conversation on Iran, but when you say there's a whole list of things that they could do, right. well, 
sure, if they face no political constraints of their own, and the most common mistake America makes in foreign policy is to not appreciate that all foreign leaders face domestic political constraints. You can call them dictators. You can call them autocrats. They all have, have, have constituencies they have to please. And, and it's very, very hard politically for an Iranian leader to say, well, we're just going to suspend enrichment with no particular assurance of getting anything in return. That is, that is at least as hard as Obama making uh, the kinds of gestures that he finds it politically difficult to make. Well, A, the politics of open societies are different than the politics of closed societies. Not as much as, that's my point, not as much as we assume. All right, well, I will differ with you. I'm not going to say that there aren't political constraints. I think we know very little about them. I don't believe... Uh, what I think is largely propaganda um, that says that you know even the reformers, even the Greens, even the Iranian, all the all the Iranian people are united upon uh, around the goal of nuclear power. I think that if you were to present that in such a way and you said, well, you know, you're going to rejoin the banking system if you just do this, and you know, it's it's and you'll get nuclear power. Um, and also, by the way, I might add that um, it's not just that; it's like they could they could not raise the sites that the IAEA wants to visit. So they could provide full access on these sorts of things. There's all kinds of I things. Think it's, I think it's good news that they're raising those sites because it means... How is that good news? Now, come on. Now you're just being... I mean, because, come on. Because How is that let, good news? Let's assume that, that right. they're doing that because there, there was the development of some technology related to actual weaponization there. Right. Uh, it, it suggests that, you know, they're giving up on that. You know, no, I mean, it I suggests mean, that they're continuing to conceal what their program really well, is from the rest of the world, including the United Nations. Well, and uh, which is which is what it is. And so when you I'm, what I, my my point here is that it's all kind of fairly transactional and you can say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of pressure and so forth. And as we said in the last one, and you were very excited when I acknowledged is that there were rational reasons for the regime to want a nuclear weapon uh, because they look around and they see what happened to Gaddafi and they see what happened mm -hmm. to Saddam. And then they mm -hmm. notice it didn't happen in North Korea, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think concedes all that much. But um, but. That's kind of well, no, where it is. Because the whole, but Eli, this is crucial. Because right. the whole, and right now, you know, at this moment, there's, there's a huge drumbeat for war in the Israeli media, or, or, or being mediated by the media, coming from, from some people uh, in, in, in government. And the whole argument is that, no, they don't want this nuclear weapon just for deterrence. These people want to wipe us out. They're crazy, or or or, or they'll or, or or they'll use it for a more generally assertive and aggressive military policy. So no, this is crucial. If you can see that it makes sense as a purely deterrent matter for them to want nuclear weapons, that's very important to the analysis of whether war makes sense. Right. It's deterring people from taking more serious action against Iran as they, you know aid and abet the slaughter of the Syrian people, support terrorist groups all over the world, and continue to intimidate not just Israel, but lots of other people in the region, and, and, and on and on it goes. Well, I, so I, I, if they I, want to continue their bellicose really behavior and their secret war with America and their okay, secret but, war with Israel, if they want to continue all that, the yes, they want a nuclear weapon. Attacking, Eli. The, the rationale is they want to wipe Israel out. They and, do want to wipe Israel out. They do. I just I'm not so sure that they would do it with a nuclear weapon because they know if they did it that way that they would themselves have a nuclear attack on. Well, so, well anyway, it's very analytically yes. important that there is a totally rational reason for them to want nuclear weapons as a deterrent, given their perception of the world. That that they that, you know they see America as an encroaching enemy, um, and and you know it, from their point of view it kind of makes sense. Right, and I think that one of the effects of the um, emphasis and focus and at times obsession with um, the pro-Israel lobby is that it is a way of, of, of uh, shifting the blame from the reckless and rogue behavior of the Iranians themselves, which is to say that, you know, the Israeli press are drumming up the war. It's the uh, pro-Israel, you know, lobby that's Pushing and well, pushing and moment, pushing for war. This is happening in the Israeli media, right? I mean, like uh, like today's headlines or yesterday's or something, right? It's all over. The Israeli right? media is obsessed with Iran because the Iranian president says all kinds of horrible things, and they know exactly who the Iranians are. 
and they know that they, it, it's there. Of course, but it that's is. That's not the news. And a lot of now. stuff that's written in the Israeli media, by the way, is like okay. Uh, anyway, but I'm just saying they're always the Israeli media is like forever hysterical. That's the nature of the Israeli media, and it's very competitive. So lots of people want to get scoops um, and and stuff like that. But I, the you know the, the 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 point here is that it's a way I think of explaining away the conflict or a conflict that could be coming up between Iran and Israel or Iran and the West in general, and a conflict that exists in very much of a sub rosa way, as I've been saying. And it's a way of explaining away without looking at all of the provocative things the Iranians themselves are doing. And I think that that has a lot more to do with these decisions at the well, end of the day than influence groups, pressure groups, lobbies, et cetera. Now, that doesn't mean that they obviously, I think when it comes to Congress, yes, the pro-Israel lobby is very influential in Congress. But Obama has a lot of constituencies. And the other thing is this. Yeah, but, you know, Congress can, has relevance here. I mean, uh, right, you know, they a do. lot of... A lot of these sanctions have been written in Congress in ways that don't give the president the authority to roll them back. So his hands have been tied by a lot of this legislation. I'd have to look into that, but I'm pretty sure that he has a ton of discretion no, with the Senate. No, he no, absolutely no. does. Don't believe that NIAC stuff. Um, the, the, he's, he, he can create a list of countries that are complying uh, or you know, beginning to reduce their exports and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of discretion. There always is with the executive branch. And even if there wasn't, this president okay. has been similar to Bush, has asserted that he has, you know, certain inherent authorities of the executive branch to ignore elements of the law that encroach in some ways on his constitutional okay. authorities. But the point, but the, all these things kind of give them, give them a lot of discretion. And they themselves have touted as a policy success how pressure and sanctions have forced the Iranians to come back to the table. And they see this as their own kind of success, and as an alternative, I might add, to war mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, I, I'm just on the substance of it, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think that sanctions that affect the Iranian economy are going to force Iran's leaders, uh, precisely because I'm skeptical of the point that you made earlier, which is that I don't think that politics are as important in a place like Iran. I think that uh, the leadership can do all kinds of things that would, are not popular with the uh, Iranian people. Um, because they, they, they can steal elections and they, can, they, they don't really particularly, uh, they're not an open but society. But Eli, it works both ways. To some extent, it's concerned with popular opinion that makes it hard for them to cave into sanctions because that is surrender to a foreign power. That, you know, so, so I think it's precisely the fact I that I think they, most Iranians hate the government so much right now that uh, um, they, would, they would welcome it as some relief and so they, they can they had, buy they Apple products and other things like that. Constituency. It's not the better educated uh, Iranians by sure. and large, but it ain't nothing. But no, we, I'm not you know, sure. We shouldn't, sure. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't. I mean, I, a what, I, I just, I, what I'm saying is that I think it's it, that, 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 that the lobby stuff is like, Overdetermined, and, and I don't want to focus. I don't want to. I, I mean, we're talking to you, but I don't want to just focus on you. There's a lot of people, and it's become more in vogue to say that. And I just don't think that that's how the world works. I think there's a lot of different concerns. And back to Obama. Well, let me, Obama, let me, wait, let me Obama, ask you a on. question. Don't yeah. you agree? I mean, I think um, yeah. a criticism of the kind of thinking you're criticizing yeah. uh, that had a lot of validity during the Iraq War was that wait a second, the Israeli government wasn't agitating for that war. You know, yeah. and, 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 you know, APEC wasn't, wasn't activated in any kind of, you know, there's arguments over whether they were a little bit, right. you know, whatever. But they, they weren't, were, really they were, it wasn't some kind of major campaign. Certainly you agree, Eli, that it is much more the case with the Iran war, that APEC and the Israeli government are, are involved in a, in a very well-organized way. Well... I would say that APAC is certainly involved in educating Congress and working to push for uh, the sanctions. That is something that they are open. They're they're openly about. As for like pushing, you know, lobbying them to for the U.S. to bomb them or something like that. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure that Howard. I, I, who knows? You know, I mean, these are these, we're a little bit beyond. Kind of what I know, but I don't, you know, that, that I just okay. don't think that something like that, like a military decision okay, like but, that, works. I think that the, you can but, talk but, but about Eli, it. The pressure isn't just for sanctions, it's for sanctions. And then when you go to the negotiating table, then when they're driven there to the negotiating table, it's against any concessions that could lead to a non military resolution. 
Okay, but, okay, Bob, line. all right, so let me, let me and just... And the pressure I, I, is on both of those fronts. Okay, so let me, let me, let me respond. Okay, if there was really an offer to diffuse the situation and to bring a bit of stability to this very unstable region and that uh, you could avert what I think what Obama's really trying to do is trying to avert uh, a major spike in the price of gasoline in an election year, which would not be good for his electoral benefits. Mm -hmm. um, if that's what he's trying to do, and he had an actual real deal, then I don't think I don't think he would be constrained. I just don't think that that actual deal is on offer. I don't think the Iranians are prepared to suspend enrichment or to do any of the things that you'd want them to do in exchange for a freeze for freeze kind of thing. And at least um, based on their prior behavior, again, I don't know We've what goes on. We've offered nothing significant for it, so we don't know. But, but that's the but. That, but the point is, is that. First of all, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an offer behind closed doors that was not made publicly. That's oftentimes in, the, in like diplomacy and negotiations, there are all kinds of things that are done that way. And mm -hmm. second of all, it's, I just, just can't imagine that the Conference of Presidents could dictate the, the mm -hmm. diplomatic or negotiating strategy for something like that. I didn't say they dictated it. I said, right. I said the importance the administration, I didn't say anything actually, so I'll say it now, the importance the administration seems to have placed on on uh, on keeping them happy is not an insignificant fact, and that's what comes from uh, the reporting in JTA. Uh, but but you, you know we um, we should okay. get back to this anti-Semitism thing. I mean we should we should we should have a whole other conversation about the Iran War anytime you want. Yeah yeah no I agree. But, but I want right. to ask you about this this Jimmy Carter appearing at the convention thing because this is related, right? Jennifer Rubin is agitating, and I don't know who else is for him to not be allowed to speak at the convention, and I guess this is because he used the word apartheid to dis uh, Yeah, this is a series of things, but okay. I mean, but, I don't know. And, and, but I think, I didn't read his book, but I thought the idea of the book was, it was called, I think, Peace Not Apartheid, and the point was, if you don't get a deal done with the Palestinians, this is a book m number of years old now, if you don't get a deal, I Israel could become an apartheid state, which I think is actually the case. That that, that, that is where things could be headed if something isn't done. Yeah. I think that's all he said. So, like, is that anti-Semitism? Uh, saying that it, no, it's not. And I don't want to conflate what I think are, you know, kind of one-sided and overheated critiques of Israel and the Jewish state with anti-Semitism. And I don't really want to be the kind of kosher cop. I don't like that kind of stuff anyway. So um, I think the stuff about Jimmy Carter is that there is a long history, Bob, of Carter uh, hearing be very naive and believing at face value things that, you know, various Hamas leaders and Hugo Chavez and other assorted rogues tell him because he's a great believer that, you know, he can be a credible kind of bridge to the American government, whether it's North Korea, and he huh. constantly kind of goes on these missions and so forth. And when you do that in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict with so many emotions running high, and he meets with a guy like Ismail Haniyeh, who's part of an organization that is eliminationist and unrepentant mm -hmm. eliminationism of Israel, at least in its charter for now. That, I think, is the kind of thing that would rub uh, Jewish okay, Democrats you know the what? wrong way. You know what? All the subsequent presidents who have been less willing to talk to all parties and consider all points of view, I think, have all failed to deliver a deal as significant as the one that Camp Carter David. delivered with Egypt. Isn't that right? Well, Carter was fortunate that Henry Kissinger had done quite a bit of diplomacy in the early 1970s after the 1973 war, and that he was also fortunate that you had a, a well, leader Kissinger like Anwar Sadat. Kissinger believes in talking to all parties himself, I think. I, I, yeah, I think, well... I think he's in, in the Carter tradition or vice versa. I am not here to argue against the idea that you can't, you should never talk to people or regimes that you disagree with. But, um, and the uh, peace deal with Egypt, even if it falls apart tomorrow, was a, a great uh, benefit to Israel's security. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. um, although one could say, depending on sort of the light of history, that under that peace deal, the, the, the cold peace, um, you had a population that became more and more anti-Israel, um, in part spurred on by the, you know, state funded press and um, the kind of posturing of various Egyptian politicians. But still, it, Israelis will tell you that it was a, uh, that, that it was a great thing mm -hmm. to have the Camp David Accords. Mm -hmm. And it's, by the way, the Camp David Accords are what has enshrined 
uh, to this day, the uh, nearly $3 billion in military aid that Israel gets every year and the nearly $2 billion that Egypt gets every year. So mm -hmm. Carter's legacy is also his military aid to Israel. Okay. Um... But if I, I, I think it's the post, it's the, his post-presidency that, um, that so uh, pisses off. And I think it was the fact that they saw his book, He's Not Apartheid in Substance, to be very one-sided. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, listen, it's, it, it's he, highly emotional. I have noticed that you have, in recent years, more than you did before, kind of waded into this, this territory. And as you can tell, it is a highly emotional, highly charged area. And I hope if, I can, if, I, if we could get one thing out of this, this conversation, it is really that, um, that something as complicated as what's going on with Iran, uh, let's not have it overdetermined by APAC or the Conference of Presidents. That's my, that's my, if I can, if, so if I've accomplished that one thing in this, this conversation, I would hope we could agree that there are, there, it's a complicated several things and that we should always keep in the front of our, of our, of our, of our mind, the, um, the, uh, record of the Iranians themselves, which have, I mean, which mm -hmm. I have, you have to say under Obama. That's two things. You want us to keep two things in mind, Eli. That's asking a lot, but go ahead. No, but I'm saying if you look at the Iranian behavior under Obama. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 hope of I think you know all decent people that Obama being a break from Bush mm -hmm. could open potentially a new avenue for diplomacy. The Iranians have acted in many ways worse than they did before, and they're in 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 in, in the suppression of uh, their own liberals and Democrats in their support for the wanton slaughter of innocents in Syria, in their continued enrichment, not just at Natanz, but now apparently also at Fordo, in all of the measures from proliferation to human rights abuses to terrorism, the Iranians have continued to be more roguish in their behavior, and that has absolutely nothing to do with the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee or the Conference of Presidents of the major Jewish organizations. Um, I agree that that has nothing to do with that. Okay. Iran's behavior is is a separate force, and there are many forces that enter into this. Um, the uh, okay, so let me make a couple of things that I would like okay. us to keep in mind. Um, Good. First, I, I haven't made these points. I do want to say I really think that uh, you know trying to enforce a speech code that would keep someone from using the term apartheid the way Carter used it, which is to warn that Israel may be headed down that path, is genuinely bad for Israel. And, and I okay. really I really do, just, just the way anyone, uh, you know, should not be insulated from either uh, criticism or, you know, concerns about the path they're headed on. I, I think that's really bad. I also think the overly loose uh, allegation of anti-Semitism is bad in that it really debases that currency. I, and, I'm, and I think it's actually happened, you know, that the term anti-Semitism, it is still a very significantly stigmatizing thing, but not, not as much probably as five years ago, precisely because the term is, has, has been used too loosely by some people. I mean, for God's sake, I think Tom Friedman, you know, I, I don't think Elliot Abrams quite said this man is an anti-Semite. You know, it was after the column Tom wrote that uh, when he said uh, that the standing ovations from Bibi Netanyahu in the Congress were bought and paid for by APEC, whatever. Uh, you know, there were these intimations that, oh, that's over. I mean, come on. You just, you know, when you start, you know, accuse, it, it, it really, it, I, I really think it's not healthy to deprive uh, a term like that, which has a valid use, um, of its strength by using it too loosely. So I think... Well, all right, but then let me counter with this, okay? The, what I've often heard is a rather sort of a soft story from uh, one side of uh, sort of the, the, the divide on um, the Israel question, which is that um, the establishment is so chock full of like this kind of pro-Israel speech code that, you know, your career will be in shambles if you, if you, if you push the limit. But I see Tom Friedman is still you know, the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, and I see Joe Klein is still at, at, at Time magazine. Mm -hmm. And I would say that this notion that 
you can't criticize Israel or criticize the occupation or point out the humanity of Palestinians who are suffering, you know, during the Operation Cast Lead uh, is false. I think the media has covered those things, and there has not been, there is not a, there's not a, um, a kind of chilling effect or something like that. So, I, listen, is it true that there are pressure groups like uh, Camera, for example, that will write letters to newspaper editors or NPR and say, you know, you should talk about uh, this settlement in this way and this, you know, and, 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 and try to kind of come up with a farrago of uh, criticisms of how the conference covered? Absolutely. And I think you can find that on the other side as well. And those groups will always exist. But I, I would say that, you know, among people who are like, regional or foreign affairs correspondents, people who are based in the Middle East, I don't think that there is a kind of uh, a, a sense that they have to self-censor themselves. I think that there has been a lot of criticism of uh, Israeli behavior and so forth. And so... Uh, I, I think there's some self-censorship. I agree that the, uh, the bounds of debate have expanded, and I genuinely think that's right. good for Israel. Um, right. So, so and, I, and then compare, and then I think that if you look at outside of an American context, uh, Israel is, is routinely, I think, treated very unfairly in other kinds of media and in other sorts of things. And so I guess, that I, as I said, I, I think that um, I, 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 didn't, I thought that that was a crude point that Friedman made about uh, having the applause bought and paid for. And it he was also something that he could very modestly. I know. And the other thing is he couldn't, it's like he's a columnist, I get it, but it's one of those things where he couldn't possibly know it either. Um, well, but no, but you know what does turn out to be the case, I think, is that, yeah. uh, I, not that this quite is the killer, is the smoking gun, but I, apparently um, APAC got a lot of Congress people for the BB address to give APAC their tickets to the gallery. So there were, they knew, Congress people giving those ovations knew that there were a lot of you know, people APAC had given tickets to literally in the building watching them, right? That was, I, I think that's, I think that's I know. the case. Well, isn't we'll, it? Will we'll, we'll our republic ever recover? Well, What's the I'm scandal saying, there? I mean, yes, look, of if, course. If he's they, making they, the they, argument that, I mean, that is a, that is certainly a link in, in the, uh, in the argument. You know, if you ask him to flesh out what do you mean these standing ovations were bought and paid for by APAC, I think that's a fact he would bring to your attention. And, you know, and of course, there are, there are donations. And look, Congress people, this is not unique. They are, you know, they, they have all kinds of lobbyists who exert all kinds of influence on them. And it's not like this is in that sense sui generis, you know. It, it's, um, it's, it's, it's business as usual. But um, anyway, the, the bounds of debate have... Uh, right. I, but I also think that I specifically... I, 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 I'm not, I don't, want to, I don't want to say I'm too worried about it because I think most of the practitioners of the kind of ruder formulation of Israel first have kind of marginalized themselves at the point and they don't really have much influence. But the, the, the notion that um, it's acceptable to say, to, 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 to explain things through a lobby and, and to and to attack other writers and journalists, who I distinguish, obviously, being a journalist myself from politicians or lobbyists, as part of one big organic group, I, I, I think that that, in some ways, debases our debate. And I would hope that we uh, kind of move away from that. I don't, I'm, I'm with you in the sense that I think that, for some reason, we, we, we tend to get very caught up in uh, meta discussions about you know, what is and what is not acceptable and the phrasing of this or the phrasing of that. And it is a kind of time-worn tradition in Washington of trying to catch somebody phrasing something in such a way and then, you know, using that as evidence to sort of ostracize them. And it's important to have those standards for racism and anti-Semitism and so forth. Um, but at the same time, sometimes it can get a bit ridiculous. But as I said, I have noticed this uptick in uh, this, this uh, lobby stuff. Okay. Well, All I, right. Well, that was, was that was that was pretty good. I mean, we were it was contentious this time, Bob, but we were. Well, this was very civil. I think it's. I, it's always civil with us. I, I'm less concerned about the future of our republic, having witnessed this civil discussion. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, given how charged the discussion is, it is that itself is kind of. I mean, a lot of no, these I things. No, really, I, I 
actually kind of mean it. I mean, no, I was, I was yeah. actually thinking, you know, after I responded to your tweet and said you want to make this a blind, I was thinking, oh God, this was like probably a mistake. You shouldn't you shouldn't talk about this stuff much in real time, right? And maybe it was a mistake, and who knows? I don't um, think it was a mistake. I don't but, think it was, but, we didn't say anything. We made I, th our point. I think both of our careers will survive, and and even if they don't, you know, we'll always have each other, Eli. There you go. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bob. Okay, well, thank okay. you. All right, good. See All you. Right.